Today is going to be an introduction into spiritual disciplines. And in future weeks, we'll expand into some of those individual disciplines. Um, but before we begin, let's just uh, take a moment to open in prayer. Father, we gather here this morning and come before your throne with hearts full and spirits receptive to your word. We acknowledge your presence among us, for we know that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are in their midst. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us and for the opportunity to dig into the truth of your word. As we begin this exploration on the topic of spiritual discipline, we ask for your guidance, wisdom, and illumination. Open our minds to receive your truth, soften our hearts to Im embrace your love, and empower us to live out the disciplines of faith with passion and perseverance. Lord, we lift our hearts in worship, knowing that you alone are worthy of all honor and praise. Bless this time of fellowship, Lord, that we may be mutually encouraged and edified by one another's faith. We commit this time into your hand, trusting in your faithfulness and relying on your strength. We ask this in the worthy and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So in order to speak about spiritual disciplines, we need to look back a bit at salvation. Because without salvation, there is no need or even ability to use spiritual discipline. In terms of an actual definition, salvation um, carries the, uh, salvation is deliverance from danger or from suffering. And the word carries with it the idea of victory, health, or preservation. Sometimes the Bible uses the word saved or salvation to refer to a temporal or uh, a physical deliverance, such as Paul's uh, deliverance from prison in Acts chapter 16. More often, though, the word salvation concerns an eternal or spiritual um, deliverance. When Paul told the Philippian jailer what he had to do to be saved, he was concerned about the eternal or spiritual destiny of that jailer. And as we see in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus equated salvation or being saved with entering into the kingdom of God. So if salvation is uh, a deliverance from danger or suffering, what is it that we are being saved from? Scripture tells us that uh, we are saved from wrath or from God's judgment for sin. Romans 5 and 9 says, Much more than, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Our sin separated us from God. And Romans 6 and 23 tells us that the consequence of that sin is death. Scripture also tells us that death is not a physical death. We all have an exp expiration date, but rather what, they are, what is being spoken of in Scripture is an eternal death, um, where the unsaved person will spend an eternity in hell, a literal hell, a place of pain and punishment for their own personal sin. Biblical salvation refers to the deliverance from those consequences of sin. When we are saved, we are saved from both the power and the penalty of sin. So who does the saving? Is there something that we can do to, um, to receive this salvation? No. Only God can remove sin and deliver us from uh, sin's penalty, and He does that through Jesus Christ. John 3 and 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Specifically, it was Jesus' death on the cross and His subsequent resurrection that achieved our salvation. Ephesians 1 and 7 says, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Scripture is clear that salvation is the gracious, undeserved gift of God, and it's only available through Jesus Christ. And when a person is saved, when they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, 
they're justified. Justification is an act whereby God pronounces a sinner to be righteous. Um, it's not something that we can earn through rule following or from um, or through good works, but rather it's made possible through the sacrificial death of Christ. It's through His blood that we are justified. A person is justified or declared righteous at the very moment of salvation. Justification doesn't excuse our sin. It doesn't um, endorse our sin, but rather our sin was fully punished when Christ paid the penalty for us. He was our substitute. Salvation, and in turn justification, um, is a one-time thing. It's a past event that will not happen again for a Christian. When we are saved, we're saved eternally. But being saved doesn't make us perfect. Um, salvation frees us from the punishment of sin. It sets us on a path towards heaven where we'll spend eternity worshiping our God for His mercy to us. But justification is not the end of the Christian's journey. God didn't send His Son to die and take on Himself the punishment for our sins just so that we could go on living our lives the way we always had. Acts 13, verses 38 and 39 say, Through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Scripture tells us that we are positionally holy, or we're set free from every sin by the blood of Christ, but yet we know very well that we still sin. That's why the Bible also refers to sanctification as a practical experience of our separation unto God. Where justification was God declaring a person righteous, sanctification is the continual process by which God is actually making the person righteous. It's the process where Christians are set apart for God from the rest of the world. We were justified when we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and we are sanctified as we grow in holiness through the work of the Spirit. Hebrews 10 and 14 says, for, a bio, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Sanctification is a present and it's an ongoing process. Before we were saved, our actions reflected our status as being apart from God and aligned with the world. But now that we've been saved, our conduct should reflect our relationship with God and being distinct from the world. Little by little, every day, those who are being sanctified, as it's said in that verse, are becoming more like Christ. And then as the third part or the third step of uh, salvation, we have glorification. And glorification is God's final removal of sin from the life of a Christian. At the point of the rapture, um, every Christian, dead or alive, um, when Jesus comes back to take His church home to be with Him, we will receive, we will be instantly transformed and receive a new body, a glorified body, one that is eternal, it's immune from death, illness, from injury and decay, a body that never grows old or tired. But in addition to a new body, we will also be given a new and perfect nature. We will no longer have any sin or any tendency to sin. Glorification is an instantaneous event in the future at Christ's return that makes us righteous. We will not be declared righteous. We will not be in the process of becoming righteous, but we will be righteous. And like justification, there is nothing that we need to do. It doesn't depend on us. It is something that God will do through His power. So, in summary of salvation, uh, it consists of justification, being made right with God, sanctification, an ongoing process of being made right or being made holy, and glorification, which is the final removal of sin from a believer. So, maybe you're thinking, I thought we were talking about spiritual disciplines. Uh, where does this topic come into what you're teaching us? Or maybe you haven't been thinking that, and I'm going to tell you anyway. 
Sanctification does not happen um, instantly when we're saved, nor does it happen automatically. Spiritual transformation or becoming more Christ-like is the work of the Holy Spirit in us as we practice the spiritual disciplines. Now, I will preface this list that, I'm, uh, that I've created by saying that there is no official list of spiritual disciplines. Um, there's no book of spiritual disciplines sandwiched in between Acts and Romans that we can go to um, to follow. But instead, this list is built from uh, scriptural principles and examples from various scriptures. Um, I'd also caution you, if in your own study, that there are a list of scriptural dis there's multiple lists of scriptural disciplines online that stray far from scripture. Um, they tend to lean more towards Eastern mysticism and New Age philosophy than they are scriptural. But the best way to avoid error in the understanding of spiritual disciplines is to stick with clear scriptural mandates and, uh, and immerse ourselves in the Word of God. But as I said, there are scriptural uh, principles and um, mandates that are given in Scripture that we can use to build our list of scriptural disciplines. And I'm going to give you a list that, uh, of examples, and in the coming weeks, as I speak, we'll be able to uh, look into some of those in greater detail. So first of all, we have prayer. And the scripture that goes along with that is, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need, Hebrews 4 and 6. I'll also mention that I, I had Noel read Romans, and I didn't end up using any of that passage in my message today. But um, if you go through there, uh, through that pa uh, passage in Romans, you'll notice that many of them, many of those things that are listed in Romans line up with these scriptural principles. So as I said, we have examples from scripture that we're building this list from. The second one is Bible study. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3 and 16. Bible reading. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, Matthew 4 and 4. And that's not a typo. There is a difference between Bible reading and Bible study. Worship. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. First Chronicles 16 and 29. Fellowship. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Acts 2 and 42. Fasting. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come, again, come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 1 Corinthians 7 and 5. Number seven is rest. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11 and 28. Service. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Colossians 3, verses 23 to 24. Generosity. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20 and 35. And then discipline making, or sorry, disciple making or witnessing. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28 and 19, and declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples, Psalm 96 and 3. Now, the practice of spiritual discipline is easier said than done. The busyness of our lives leaves little room for intentional spiritual growth. It requires intentionally saving a slice of precious time and a dose of energy to commit to the disciplines in order to grow to be more like Christ. 
Spiritual growth should not be seen as a part-time undertaking, but as a lifelong commitment. And so from the time of salvation, ideally, or at least from this moment, we as individuals need to establish Christian habits that will strengthen our resolve to be more like Christ. How does this benefit us? Practicing these uh, disciplines takes uh, time, it takes effort, it takes intent. I recently made a recommendation to my company to purchase a tool, an expensive tool, a $15,000 tool. Did they just hand over the credit card, uh, company credit card to me and say, go get it? No, of course not. Um, they had to crunch the numbers. They had to determine how many jobs do we have lined up to, that will use this tool. How can we charge, or how much can we charge per use of the tool? And um, how long will it take before we recover the cost of that tool? They want to be sure that the income that we get from using that would be far greater than the cost to purchase it. What is our personal ROI, or return on income, for practicing spiritual disciplines? What do we get back in return for our time and effort? Well, the first and most important benefit of spiritual growth is the intimate relationship that you develop with God. As we read His Word daily, as we commune with Him in prayer, He communicates His will and His desires for our lives and helps us to understand our purpose for His glory. In addition to the heavenly rewards, uh, spiritual maturity also benefits your physical life. As you go, grow in Christ, you will experience many changes um, in your marriage, your career, your health, finance, character. Everything begin, begins to take a turn for the better. Now, I'm not suggesting that the Christian life does not have any trials, um, that it's always perfect. But rather, I'm suggesting that by implementing spiritual disciplines, we are better suited to handle those trials when they come our way. Sin is the primary uh, enemy of the Christian. Many believers um, want to live a life for God. They want to fulfill the ministry that God has put into their hands. And deep down, they know that uh, they want a better relationship with God but then sin gets in the way. One day they're burning for Christ, and the next day they are back into sin. And it's a constant struggle as you um, start, it's a constant struggle until you start investing your time into your spiritual growth, which gives you the strength to resist whenever it sh uh, sin shows its ugly head. Through the consistent practice of disciplines, uh, such as prayer, Bible reading, and worship, we develop a deep affection and appreciation for the beauty, truth, and presence of God um, in our lives. This love for the things of God becomes a source of joy, peace, and fulfillment, and it fuels a hunger for righteousness, a thirst for spiritual growth, and a passion for God's kingdom purposes. These are just some of the benefits that um, I've thought of, and I'm sure that you can come up with many more of your own. Um, but these benefits don't just affect us. As we become closer to God, as we become more Christ-like, we have an effect on those around us as well. Our individual spiritual growth can only benefit the church. Having a better understanding of God's Word, a greater appreciation of His mercy and of God's um, of His grace and His love, it, um, it produces future leaders in the church. It ensures that the church is well protected um, from false teachings when we have a greater understanding of Scripture. And that's the reason that Peter encourages, encourages spiritual growth in 2 Peter 3, verses 17-18 where he says, therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may, be, may not be carried away by the error of lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 
In summary, our sanctification is a present and it's an ongoing process. It takes time and it takes commitment to form a habit of, of uh, spiritual disciplines. And the sooner that we begin to form these habits, the sooner that we will see the benefits of them. But we don't just do this with our own ability, but rather with the help through, of the Holy Spirit. So that's just a summary, and uh, we will go into some of those disciplines in the future weeks as I, as I preach. So let's just pray. Father, as we conclude our time together, we thank you for the richness of your word and the guiding of your Holy Spirit. We pray for any who do not know the truth of salvation for themselves, that you would open their eyes to the urgency of accepting Christ as Savior. Father, we don't know the time when our Lord will return to call us home, but we do know that time is fast approaching. We pray that you would continue to see souls turn to you before it's forever too late. In the meantime, may those of us being sanctified continue to grow in your knowledge, your love, and your mercy. May we encourage our brothers and sisters around us so that we may see your name proclaimed strongly in the Long Branch area. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.